a lot of organizations are losing 50 to 70 percent of their first year intake within 12 months the role of the landlord is is evolving from just providing leases to providing shared space or what we call space as a service this is the key trend as to what's coming next and a great thing for people that are interested in this to get involved with is what's called the spatial web. Think of the sustainability benefits, the, the lifestyle benefits. It's just a really good use of the resources we already have. The property industry is, I call it, radically conservative. Right. It'll do anything it can to stay the same. <laughs> <laughs>
companies that have very much thrived in the past on a face-to-face way of working, they 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 you know have a lot of rethinking to do, um, or you know recalibrating their their people as to how they want to work. One of our um, one of our mastermind members was one of the first to probably move into a new premise, um, and we all just assumed that okay, every less people in the office, generally speaking, so you probably take up less floor space. And I actually took on, I think it was 20% more floor space because of the design of, you know, it wasn't the big um, client facing boardrooms on the windows. It was these walls that move around and then the floor goes up and down and it's all these spaces that can be sort of transformed, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. For, Which, for more team activities and getting people that's together. Right. Um, and it's not just, you know, it's not this nine to five Monday to Friday. There's a there's a peak generally, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yep. and Fridays is a drop off. So I think we've got some real fundamental questions to ask in terms of utilisation and sustainability. Yep. Does it make sense yep. having all these towers fitted out for the peak time on a Wednesday, mm. and you know, empty for or, or significantly lower utilisation for the rest? So it's it's a really complex well, area. Let's say Alex is a Let's put your uh, consulting hat on. Alex is a property developer. Um, he's just got a, about to build a brand new skyscraping commercial mm. tower in, let's say, in Melbourne here. What would your um, advice around the utilisation, you know, best utilisation for that be? And is that different to what it might have been sort of pre-COVID or earlier in your career or in a different country, for example? Yeah, it, it was it was always evolving this way, but it's that's been accelerated um, so what what generally companies do it's a bit different uh, for a large company because they can consolidate their portfolio and you know those spaces you're talking about they've probably got already so it's around utilizing them it's yep. really hard for a small and medium company you can't afford to have all these spaces sitting around at you know, right. expensive rents so what what's going to need to happen is the role of the landlord is is evolving from just providing leases to providing shared space or what we call space as a service. Okay. So now we've seen the first wave of that with WeWork. Mm. Now what made WeWork really successful, and this is getting a bit nerdy here, so right. stop me if I'm going too far, but um, they fitted into the landlord model of leases, yeah. um, but provide flexible space for their users. So if you were one person, 20 person, even 100 person, you could go to WeWork and say, we want to rent the space for a week, a month, a year, whatever. Um, Landlords are going to have to start doing some of that themselves um, and provide space that's maybe pre-fitted out or or half-fitted or fully fitted out so that you can then just modify it. So I think we're going to see a lot more shorter term, more flexible spaces um, and the role of landlords almost developing the skills of a hotel or a uh, an incubator or accelerator, uh, creating a business ecosystem. So I have this, um, I guess, slightly different way of looking at the purpose of, of your tower that you're you're building. Right. The you probably think of it as a fantastic investment that your children and their children will, you know, use um, for the rest of their lives. But mm-hmm. the only purpose I see is actually for businesses to operate in there. Yeah. So that it, it's it's a space for business to yeah. thrive, um, and I think more and more we need to create buildings and cities, um, not a sort of um, you know placid things, but active things that that actually help business to work across business and create ecosystems. Yeah, and I've been involved in some of the first innovation precincts like Tomsley Park in Adelaide and, and the um, the medical precinct in, in Adelaide, you know, creating buildings and precincts around particular types of innovation, I, I think is where we're going to end up ultimately. Because yeah. you had Tony on the, Tony Nash on the podcast and he had a pretty like, direct view on working from home or versus working remote, especially for the younger generation. Maybe do you want to throw that in, Alex? Yeah, well, I think... Certainly, I think a lot of people feel that sort of the younger generation miss out on a lot of the learning that happens, uh, yep. sort of, you know, which by osmosis almost when you're sitting near people and you're absorbing what goes on. 
on day to day level and the ability to quickly ask someone a question um, you know, informally. Yep. Um, I think that was sort of the main thrust of a lot of people's concern of not returning to work. You know, that, to that's completely yeah. right. And mm. it, it's, it's that um, overhearing osmosis learning, but it's mm. also being able to connect with other people your own age. Yes. And because yeah. a lot of times um, younger people are nervous about appearing silly to their superiors. So, you know, mm. I think just as important is that peer to peer yeah. kind of relationship uh, as well, which often gets forgotten. But yeah, I, I completely agree with that. The, yeah. There's a whole, you know, we're not going to change a million years of evolution. Mm. Um, we, we do need and that uh, to bring people together, particularly for that learning by osmosis. Sure. And, and in some cases, some of our clients were actually um, in areas where they're trying to recruit, like, you yeah. know, the software engineers again, they're actually building lounges in the in the office, which is like a transition from their bedroom, mm. the university as a segue, because we don't need the same model of the office. So we, we're building new spaces that yeah. haven't been in office mm. buildings before yeah. as a sort of a transition to make, so they don't lose. You know, a lot of organizations are losing 50 to 70% of their first year intake within 12 months wow. right. because yeah. that experience is not a yeah. good one for them. It's too much of a leap from yeah. sitting in your bedroom coding. Yeah. Yes, and I think the other interesting point uh, Tony made the other day was saying that the opportunities typically go to those people with FaceTime, you know, with the senior management effectively. That's so right. if they happen to be in the office, um, then obviously that I think the perception is those people, those are the people working, doing, willing to put the hours in. Therefore, they probably get the first opportunities. So potentially, maybe that's a question about measuring output. Or that always know, used to be the case when I mean, this isn't new. Yeah. This, no, this no. I mean, um, you know, people have been working in a remote way for a long time, particularly in places like the UK, as soon as the mobile phone and the screeching modem were kind of invented, mm. you know, we, we had people working in lower, you know, different environments. So this isn't new, but that, that was the data that those people that worked more remotely were the first to let go in recessions and, right. and with, you know, got the last in the line for a promotion. So yeah. totally. But uh, another side of what you were just saying is that, um, executives or leadership now need to be much more present in the workplace just to to be around those younger people mm. um, so that there's a real role now to you know actively spend more face-to-face -face time on yep. you know those ad hoc sort of bump type moments and, and another thing too is you know you mentioned in, introverts before I, I think we've got to do more than just have an event and bring them in we've actually got to um, use uh, nudging, you know, the same sort of software that's on What's your it Instagram no. where it, you know, if you happen oh. to Google, I don't know, tool chests at Bunnings or something, yep. um, suddenly you get all this stuff on Instagram, Facebook promoting it. So the same sort of thing leave, needs to happen in space that, yeah. that, you know, hey, you've got an interest in this or you're working on this project and, and organisations like Publicis and others have been doing this for a number of years to use AI to speed the, the the knowledge around i mean the i think this is the key trend as to what's coming next and a great thing for people that are interested in this to get involved with is what's called the spatial web which isn't new but i think there's emerging a new way to look at it which is not from the conventional two-dimensional software companies because yeah. if you look at your phone and it's all two-dimensional it's data video images etc but think of it the other way from three dimensional space and the human, but with technology enabled space, it's like a 180 degree different way of looking at it. Mm. And I think that's where we're gonna go with office buildings is physical nudging um, and, a, and a much more enhanced experience, which is mi mixing food, events, working. Um, so I, I see it as a you know, really dynamic, exciting field, not, yeah. not yeah not a, oh, let's go back to the way we were yeah. opportunity. Well, because um, you sort of reminded me, you mentioned sort of the habitual, we're habitual creatures and talked about sort of the evolution and maybe some human behaviours. And maybe I'll just share a, an example and maybe you can put some colour around it. So I started early in my career at Telstra and at that stage we had all the general manager type or senior managers that had these offices with fridges and desks and so you could shut and open the door and it would be, you know, that type of environment. 
There was also, um, I think, a gym that as an employee you had access to go to. Uh, there was also a food cafeteria that you could go to on another level. And so you sort of had your exercise, your food, you had your fridge there and you could have <laughs> a refreshment at the end of the day. Um, and then I look at maybe one of my later years when I was uh, back in at Telstra and it was hot desking. Uh, so I would take a backpack in with my laptop and um, whatever else I had for the day, bring my own lunch, I'd have my own gym subscription, I'd put it all in the locker, but then I'd go and sit on the exact same pod that I would always sit and the people around me were the exact same people. Um, so, yeah, what, when you're sort of from a, the inception point where you're like, this is a good idea to move into hot mm. desking because of all the collaboration and things, and then there's the behaviour, is that, was that different or like... <laughs> How does that get factored into wow. uh, some that, of the... <laughs> that's a whole whole area of... Um, yeah, I mean, th then this is where I, I mean, like, specifics become really important. Like, hot desking is something that was developed for salespeople to have right. a spot to come and write up stuff when they came in. It's not generally what, you know, people have been trying to do in, in a modern progressive workforce, workplace. But <laughs> it's almost... In, in my experience, what's happened is... Um, ideas are developed for models yep. pilots are done experiments are done and they can work really well and then people look at it without understanding the depth of thinking that went into it mm. and copy it and it just looks the same but it doesn't work so yeah. there's there's a propensity in design to just copy and paste and to to look at the wrong things whereas if you come at it from like the science of work or organizational science or whatever that's a very different view than what does it look like? Um, Open Plan was developed by the Quick Borner Management Consultant team out of Frankfurt, you know, it, it, and it was highly developed around paper flows, and it had plants and cafes, and you know, this is in the fifties, like right. it was great. Then it got to America, and it got dumbed down to Dilbert Cubicle Land. <laughs> Same sort of thing happened with you know this idea of activity settings, which goes back to 1985, a Harvard Business Review article which basically said an office, you know, that office with the fridge yep. or an open plan desk or a meeting room isn't ideal for all tasks, but it's maybe well suited for one or two. So the idea was provide a range of these ideal spaces, give you the mobile technology you now have and, a, and the freedom of the management culture yeah. to not have someone watching you work, but you, you can choose where you want to work. That's mm -hmm. how it started out. And then it ends up getting turned in this massive space efficiency drive and all the good stuff gets thrown out. Yeah. Mm. That's kind of a history of the workplace in yeah. a couple <laughs> of paragraphs. <laughs> in, in minutes, yeah. I didn't know it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, 1950s where the open plan, I thought we were really progressive going to open plan in the 90s. No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, keeping maybe the international theme and I know you've sort of moved around as well, Alex, and seen the world, but... Um, is there, are you seeing anything that's a direct contrast to what's happening maybe here in Australia or Southeast Asia or um, that you think, yeah, that's probably where things are going or is an extreme case or, yeah, anything you can add? add? I, I think Australia over the last 20 years or so has pretty much been at the front of what's been going on with, with exceptions of, you know, really interesting case studies that might pop up. Um, and that's continued. I think there's a there's a momentum. There's some interesting organisations, um, you know, like the Googles that have a very particular model, which are, you know, global. Yeah. Um, but even then, probably the, some of their best examples are in Singapore and mm. and Tokyo. You know, away from the Google Plexes in America. Yeah. Um, it, it things spread very quickly now. Ideas, but um, I think some of the work. I think the next generation of work is going to be in the supply side, so the what the landlords are going to do. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the innovation because most, particularly in Australia, it's a bit different in Europe where organisations still build their own headquarters, but here it's all very much lease space. So yeah. it's, it's actually driven and potentially at the moment being held up by the supply side of the equation. And, you know, Australian owners are uh, some of the most sophisticated there are. So, you know, I, I think we'll see that charge here as quickly as we'll see it anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Because that, could, I mean, would you be able to explain as well? Because I, I find it counterintuitive where 
let's say we go back to Alex's building, it's all built now and he's managing it and he's... Yeah, I hope it's leased because there's like quite big vacancies <laughs> at the yes, moment, but I'm, exactly. I'm sure you got it right. Which is, which, is a good, which is a good thing to raise. Vacancy rates are you know, higher than what they've been traditionally, but landlords, there's a resistance because we're, we're in the market, we're looking for a new home mm. potentially, but there's a resistance to take on a short lease or um, you know a sublease or or anything like that because there's this idea or well not an idea but they say it affects the um, the yield of the building and then therefore that affects the sale value of the potential building and therefore that yep. affects the yep. eventual owner who is the super fund or whoever yep. actually owns Alex's building for example but yep. but if there's an offer on the table and it's not the place is not leased then why is that transaction being prevented so we're happening. we're in a we're in a holding pattern at the moment because the valuations are based on the on the 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 lease value so the the what's called the whale the weighted average lease expiry so if you take space out of that and build this flexible short lease space it gets de in in the valuations model it gets devalued right so it, it immediately hits the the asset value if you're getting it revalued if it's a private building it doesn't matter but if it's in a unit trust or something and it needs to get revalued, it'll, so there's a reluctance to do it. That's that's part of the equation. So Alex, property is worth what it could get on the market versus the cash it's getting in the door. Is that well, that, that's the second part. That right. if if there's not enough examples of these new types of buildings for the valuation industry to say that's a legitimate form of income that we can bank. Right. Um, so it will take. It's kind of chicken and egg until we build the model. Get the get a few years of cash flow and prove that it works. And look, it should increase the value because the you know when people move to sharing of space, you know densities used to be about 20 square meters a person. Yep. They they whittled their way down to about 10 square meters a person. Everyone was really worried. Oh, there's going to be all this empty space. What it meant was that the rents went go up and and utilization goes up. So I see the same thing happening here. That that Monday to Friday will will have maybe cheaper space on a Monday if you want a meeting room to encourage startups and others right. to use buildings, you'll end up this blended rate. Right. But overall, you know, every coffee you buy, every room you book, every time you sit down, whatever, mm. the, the landlord will clip the ticket on it. Yeah. And that should add up to more than what just a basic lease would, would project. But we need to prove that before the valuation industry will accept it. Yeah. Wow, dynamic pricing. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting time Monday, of the... Yeah. But, but imagine the software you need to do that. But importantly, yeah. and I think this is one of the blockages at the moment, is um, it's a completely new type of skill set mm. for an owner to have. You can't just... It, that's why WeWork work, because they go, oh, we'll just give it to WeWork, they'll pay the rent, and they'll provide the flexible space. Yeah. Um, WeWork couldn't invest fast enough in all the systems it needed yeah. to to efficiently pay for it, and the scale they grew kind of killed that initial culture that they had, and it became became taken over by sort of corporates having additional space. So it kind of, mm. you know, they kind of grew too quickly to sort of tweak the model. I think mm. the model is absolutely right, and we're seeing lots of other companies grow and fill up that void. And I think ultimately that will become a major uh, player, but not where they're just feeding themselves. We need them to support the whole building. So the landlord needs to learn a whole range of skills around um, software development. Um, there's a famous HBR article um, from it's probably a decade ago now that ranked the um, technology innovation and investment by industry and property was second last out of about 21 industries, just above hunting and fishing. Wow. So it, it, you know, it's it's been oh slow gosh. to the prop tech party. Yeah. Why um, is that? People just chasing yield and not wanting to. Like yeah, it's it's been in growing markets like, you know, the Sydney CBDs. It's and and low interest rates. It's been easy to get money. It's been high demand. You know, limited sites, particularly in good spots in cities. Mm. So it's been until this disruption, it's been pretty straightforward. Mm. Um, so. You know, I, th I think, you know, we were talking earlier that cities are constantly evolving. You know, the, a lot of these, if you look at, say, the top end of Collins Street in Melbourne where we are now, the, you know, that had a very different look and feel. It had a lot more fashion and Flinders Lane was full of 
yep. you know, fashion and other things. So cities are constantly evolving. And just because you build a big office tower there doesn't mean that's not going to have to evolve too. And what are you, what's your uh, view on, you know, there was this whole, was it the egg, the fried egg city? So we'll have a, the micro cities. So, you know, the build the hubs. Yeah, the 15-minute cities, 15 those kind of things. 15-minute cities, yeah. is that? Yeah. I mean, that was sort of a bit of a pre-COVID um, concept. Is that still happening or is it even more so now? With No, I think it's still a viable concept, um, particularly uh, like one of our clients um, had quite a big call centre type um, group as part of what they did and yeah. they had it in the city, um, expensive, you know, people that are buying places further out. Maybe the public transport infrastructure isn't great, you know, the Victoria in particular and most of the states are investing heavily in rail to sort of address some of those things. Yeah. But, you know, it became apparent that you could get good employees, you could use shopping centres um, as uh, an easy place to park, particularly not on weekends, um, and you could actually convert department stores that were pulling out into sort of office space that had team meeting rooms and whatever. So those, those contact centre people could easily work from home three or four days a week. Yep. They might come in one day a week for a team day and you could book and use the space for that as you did it. That you know, Think of the sustainability benefits, the, yeah. the lifestyle benefits. It's just a really good use of the resources we already have. You know, It's a great example of adaptive reuse. So I think these questions are, you know, you've got to get into the detail to, yeah. to, to understand or, or to be able to um, think about what, what are the opportunities. Yeah. Um, Just makes me think, you're in Japan recently, Alex, I'm not sure where you stayed hotel-wise, but there's a hotel there where you check in and you check into a modular box and it physically moves around. Have you come across like that and is there an application for that in sort of more the corporate real estate market or...? Um, I think they're called love hotels, isn't that what they? There's a uh, yes. I think this idea of bre the nine to five is a is a real legacy system from the industrial age, mm. and yeah. and I think the the way we live and work um, can vary according to the lifestyles we want to have. I, I I definitely think we're going to have more flexibility of you know what we do in our spare time, mm. what, what we do to earn a living. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the history of, say, factories, the first factories were actually um, families and teams that did components. So they, they were very much, almost like the, the cottage industry put yep. under a big roof. And yep. then that evolved into the, you know, with Frederick Taylor and others evolved into the, the modern mass production that we have and now the Japanese systems for continuous improvement. I mean, yeah. so, you know, I, I see this idea of nine to five, you know, that hierarchical space allocation and everyone's got to be in at the same time. It's a real legacy system that we have to kind of move away from if we yeah. want to be sustainable and provide, you know, a, a pleasant future for our young people. It's, yeah, it's a great example because I mean, we've basically left, left the farm where, okay, if you milk the cows or whatever your speciality is, mm. the job's done, so you, it's finished. And you're right. Then that that talent's coming into the factory, and then it's nine to five. And so, oh, why, why don't we have this running 24 hours sort of mm. thing? And it, the disconnect between outcome and space or, or Absolutely. work. Absolutely. So I think it's really exciting what's happening in the city of Melbourne. That yeah. you know leases for um, retail spaces and restaurants, cafes. You know the the early morning office rush and lunch rush, and then close at 3 p.m. Mm. is now being replaced with more of an evening economy. Um, mm. cycle so I think it's it's fascinating as I say how cities evolve and um, you know p people still want to come to the city they still want to do things with other humans but it's it's just different from that legacy system of nine to five office work yep. yeah I guess that sort of links into what we're seeing in the US with the waxing and waning of the, the life of the inner city you know and how desirable it is to, to live and work there and that seems to be sort of like a 40-year cycle or something uh, well, yeah, or I, I see it actually more as something that's continuously okay. just evolving. And, you know, it, it's kind of dangerous to build like a single-use tool. Yeah. You know, it's it, and I think that's where the interesting work will happen to office buildings. So, you know, I'd encourage you if your office building's still in the design phase to think about <laughs> what are the other things that you would put in it other than just office space. Yeah. Uh, and does that imply sort of interaction with public as well, not just sort of business-to-business -business interaction? So then you're... 
opening up to I don't know. Well, yeah, about maybe not impacts. all the public, but yeah. but yeah, yeah a, a bit more diversity. And I think you'll get buildings that will try and cater for different things. Yeah. So the same way you have a whole spectrum of hotels and restaurant types, I think we'll see these building as an ecosystem and you'll get a really diverse mix of them depending on where they are. Like if they're in the legal precinct, they're going to have more of that flavour or they could have a, you know, a philosophical or a cultural sort of difference. If, you know, they could be near universities. Yeah. Um, it could, could be an innovation district that springs up of something that was there before. I, th I think that's, yeah. that's where I'd be putting my monies in things that are going to have a, a long future with, with something that's specific and, and is something that is a growing business opportunity. Yeah. James, can you, can you quickly point out a good example of an innovation hub? Yeah, Tonsley Park is, is great. Like, despite all the Going doom and gloom it, yeah. about manufacturing, mm. um, you know, there, there is actually a lot of manufacturing that still goes on. It's just not the big straightforward stuff. Like, there's right. a lot of, um, uh, you know, different specialist manufacturing. And, um, you know, I've got a client in Japan, a little company called Mitsui, and, yeah. and every year they, they get me to organise a study tour of latest office stuff in Japan because they, they travelled the world and they realised right. that a lot of the innovations in Australia. So okay. they come here. I took them to Tonsley Park a year or so ago. It's the best thing they've ever seen. Wow. Like reuse, the dynamics of it. Yeah. Um, it's just that South Australia, so no one wants to know anything about it. But yeah. I think it's interesting that South Australia now has the fastest growing economy uh, in Australia. Um, that's, that didn't happen by accident. That's like 20 years of investment in what's coming next. They've got the second largest um, biomedical precinct in the world. Um, the, a building called the SAMRI, which is the Health and Medical Research Institute, yep. is a model on how you write a business case, build a building, create a culture, and attract people from around the world to go and work there. Um, so that we've got some world-class examples in Australia. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're loving this podcast, please give us a five-star review. You mentioned Thanks. study tour there. Um, you also mentioned sort of Silicon Valley uh, mm -hmm. a little bit before, and um, you know, they were probably one of the first to have the ping pong tables and yeah. even you know, like catch that got bought out by Coles with the, the slide in the office and just sort of these fun, wacky yeah. things, which was sort of pre-COVID. But is there any um, anywhere you'd recommend? So let's say I'm a CEO or an exec that's looking at my lease is coming up, the potential to do something different mm. in that business. Is there any inspiration I should be, you'd recommend I draw, whether it's from a country or a company, or what would you sort of suggest are some good things to think about? Um, I, I can think of three things. Um, first of all, is just basic location and logistics, like look at where your labour force is going to be living, because housing is a, is a main issue. So, you know, potentially train is becoming a much more important network mm. tool a bit like london like yeah. pretty much mm. it's tube tube or british rail and yeah. you can live further out on british rail and they become key determinants where you labor so i think look at look at that and where your labor pool is as a starting point for zoning in on an area yeah and that may be quite different than where some of the premium office buildings might be um secondly i think you know, the leadership team, the next generation need to think carefully about what their culture is and and mm -hmm. what do they want to actually do with getting people together and, and thinking of their business model around what's unique and what, what's going to drive their success. Um, and then thirdly, at this point, I would start looking for those early adopter buildings that are providing a lot of shared amenity that you can pay as you go and variableize your cost base mm. and then lastly you'd then fill in the gaps with your own space um, so that that's the kind of logic framework i think yep. i'd go through <clears throat> and that is, is that sort of where most new builds most you know large new builds are having that you know, ground floor uh, conference center facilities and the you'd think so subs. but no Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, the property industry is I call it radically conservative. Right. You do anything it can to stay the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz you know it's it's fair enough like I'm yeah. making light of it but it's serious stuff it's your superannuation money it's it's yeah. it's funds it's it's got a huge sustainability impact like you 
you don't want radicals doing it. You you want serious, mm. yeah. long term thinking in it. Um, but it doesn't make it easy. You know those strengths make it difficult to innovate mm -hmm. and change. Yeah. So if you're that tenant looking for those buildings, you know the, the, at this point a lot of it is not there. Right. The, the choices are not there. The, the the sophistication behind the usability model. There's a lot of you know some landlords are actually creating these spaces, but have got no way of using them. They can't charge you for them. They they don't put the right people in there to manage them so that it's a friendly experience. And right. Yeah, right. there's a lot of work to be done. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like James. It's a bit of an off-key question, uh, but how important is the, the the concept of feng shui when dealing with uh, sort of space in Asia? And it uh, it's, it's huge, but it, it's 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 not a it's not a wacky idea. Like it's a very human form mm. kind of idea. It's, it's uh, so I've, I've done a number of projects, um, you know, in the region, but also here with people that have lived and worked in Hong Kong, and mm. maybe they were skeptics at first. But anyone who spent significant time in Hong Kong comes away knowing that there's, you know, some real common sense kind yeah. of aspects to it. So yeah, I, I, I think it actually helps enormously for just good intuitive design. Yeah. So things like flow of people and yeah. flow of energy and, and creating, you know, places that are different to go to, I think are fundamentals. So yeah, so you see that being used across spaces like Australia, for example. Hundred percent. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. done fit outs yeah. here like yeah. for um people I can show you where the little elephants have been put and where which which columns they put the gold coins in and Excellent. but the, I mean the encouraging thing for me is I you know, I I I like to design collaboratively. Mm. So it, it's rather than you know, having a threat, I'd, I'd really look forward to working with them. And I was, I was really pleased actually that they actually liked that. I don't like just the straight lines because there's not a lot of that in nature. Um, no. So I, I, yeah, I was really encouraged when they actually really liked the, the flow of the space and how it worked and, and just had to minor tweak it. But, and also I think um, we're doing a hospital at the moment and um, indigenous thinking about space is uh, is another area that's really interesting and really useful um, where you know there's no straight lines in in indigenous culture it's circles and curves and and mm. i think that's a a really interesting way of um, designing spaces for humans yeah, yeah. definitely would well, you often look to nature in terms of your inspiration for yeah i mean biophilia is a is a yeah. is a really growing area has been for a long time um, this idea of using sort of nature in buildings, um, particularly, yeah. you know, when it's when it's really carefully and thoughtfully done, like, you know, we can now start to use materials like timber in buildings and yeah. and, and put a lot more plants um, mm. and, and, you know, improve air quality, temperatures, etc. So we're getting, you know, we've, we've made huge leaps from that horrible open plan we were talking about where everything's made of, you know, bad materials mm -hmm. and things that, uh, to create really good fit out. So I think the fit out industry has come a really long way in the last 20 years. You know, I'd, mm. I'm on a few awards, help judge things. So you get to see hundreds of different things and you know, the, the quality is universally high of, of most spaces now. Yeah, that's pretty good. So I think, you know, those business leaders who are embarking on their new workspace. There's there's a plethora of talent mm. in places like Australia to, to really design good space. Yeah, reminds me of my old office in Singapore. It was yeah, just wall to wall sort of plants. And then I had the sort of big open sort of roof space as well, and all down the side of the building. I think it was helping with with airflow and temperature and everything. Else. You probably don't even need to plant them yeah. in Singapore. They just grow just grows, yeah, exactly. from the minute you get off the ta yeah. or into the taxi. You see yeah. this lush paradise, and the gardens there are amazing. Yeah, they're stunning. Yeah. Mm. But but you do get those completely different looking buildings. Like it, it'll go eight, ten stories up, and then have a very big outside space. Mm. And then it'll have a huge cavity, and then there's more like volume. Is that a restriction thing that's done that design, or is like are you across those? Buildings? Yeah, so a lot of climates, far in here. like you can you can be in Brisbane, a lot of Sydney workspaces. You, we can work a lot more outdoors or in semi kind of conditioned right. space. A um, bit more difficult in Melbourne because we've got colder winters and winds and things. But yeah, there's I, I mean. Mm. The way I look at it, this sort of Mies van der Rohe type model of a of an office building is pretty much a 30s idea, and it was all about status, modularity, everything. I mean, it's beautiful, 
but it was only for a period in time. So the more we can evolve that concept and develop, you know, a new type of form, I think that's really exciting. Yeah. But but it needs the businesses to think about it carefully and come to the designers with a really good brief. You know, don't expect the designer to just randomly get your culture right. Like they'll they'll design what they think or what they want to do. Yeah. But you know, the, and that's my kind of work as a consultant is to help the client think about the business value and the cultural value of what they're creating so that you can brief the designer or, or choose the buildings in a better way. So when they're thinking, are they thinking about how they would like to work or what they're, like, how, what do they need to sort of communicate to you to then come up with, you know, there's so many selections of finishes and um, lines or curves and all, all these options, but what's the ideal intel that you'd need to then be able to really create a design that's sounds like custom and bespoke for that individual you can do it you know reasonably mathematically of of understanding you know how you want to get your people together the rhythm of business the cycle of things um creativity you know how do you how do you encourage creative thinking design thinking you know no matter what the discipline i I mean I, i i've done a lot of work over the years with you know, many of the banks and investment banks and, you know, that that whole idea of why should it be dull and grey and, you know, let, let's, let's look at other industries like advertising and others where they stimulate creative thinking and, and yeah. create bump and, and, you know, now nudge yeah. that we can actually <clears throat> help speed up processes and, in, you know, either better ideas, better implementation, speedier implementation or fail quickly, um, but actually you know get things to market quicker and grab market share so these are you know i see it as a serious business tool not a not a bolt on it's not a it's not a flower in the lapel yeah it's Mm. the whole suit and and you know it's a business tool and it's hugely important i think to attracting and keeping people to to really physically show that you're serious about what you you're doing it's i'm sure you've seen it in your careers when you 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 see organisations that say one thing and when you meet them and look at their culture, it's completely the opposite. I, totally. I think the next generation's pretty switched on about that and not mm. prepared to sit there for years. And James, for my, ben- for my benefit, um, how do you encourage innovation with space? What's the, what are the main traits? So, I mean, if you look at the creative process, mm. um, there's, a, there's a lot of time that's like the incubation, the chance encounters. So I'm actually a... We've mentioned Japan a bit. There's this thing called the Seki model of, of knowledge creation and, and management. And a lot of the office buildings I've done, and you know, I've done buildings you know, up to 100,000 square metres, mm. uh, are based on this Seki model of socialisation, externalisation, combination, and then implementation of, of, of ideas. Mm. So I, I don't think this is an accident. I think you know, when you study the theory of creativity and, and thinking it, it becomes reasonably straightforward how you you move mm. through that innovation cycle, and um, you know, really, we were talking about it before um, of young people learning by osmosis and those sort of things. Um, there's two types of knowledge. I'm sure everyone knows this: the explicit and the tacit. Um, the explicit you can write down, the tacit you can't, and we are wired for tacit. Like I'm, I'm doing a hospital. You know, the most important thing I think in terms of their workplace is to come back to a space and be able to share your tacit knowledge. You know, it's literally could be life or death or, you know, a crossing over of information. What's tacit? What is tacit? So it's stuff you can't write down, basically. So it's what we're doing right now with our visual cues and, right. and it's that learning by osmosis and all of yep. these things that how we learn from babies uh, onwards uh, of, of how we, we share information. Um, you combine that with the creative process of you know, creating that socialization where you, you have, that's what's great about cities and buildings, those, all those chance encounters of different people. It's what we're doing at universities at the moment to, mm. to take the traditional schools and mash them together to create clusters of, yeah. of different fields. And, and I think that whole breaking down of silos of knowledge yeah. is, is where we're gonna be for the next 50, 100 years. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems to be where a lot of the innovation comes, the, the joining of two different spheres and the, that, that communication suddenly sparks 
Yeah. Yeah. The next idea. No, I think that urban planning uh, angle is, and obviously the legislation that goes along with that, as, as I say, it's got to be very well thought out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really interested in yeah. what happens within the space, whereas others are yeah. more interested in the external logistics mm. and, and mm. look and feel. But yeah. yeah, I have this view that the purpose of it is pretty important. <laughs> yeah. So James, just wanted to check in. We're about to move into sort of more uh, short form Q&A, but um, we're talking about Citroens and Michelin stars and all sorts of things <laughs> before the podcast. But did you actually, um, I know we've sort of uh, ran the questions down a few different uh, rabbit Warrens, but uh, was there something uh, that you came here today and you thought, oh, I hope they asked me about that because I could answer that. Maybe we'll give you the chance to throw your answer to your own question in here. Oh, that's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> then it'd just be Q&A. Where you do you land Q &A on yourself. that? Yeah. Oh, if not, Alex has got about 20 in the chamber to fire at you. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we fire away. That. Probably that bit about how cities are evolving, that's what I was hoping we'd, we'd yep. get to because too often it's a broad generalisation um, and a, um, a limited sort of view. But you know, I think, you know, when you study the way cities like New York have evolved over the last 150 years, mm. you realise it's a constant thing. It's not just a, it's not a steady state. You know, we walk into Collins Street and think it's always been like that. It hasn't, it's, it's evolved a lot. You know, a lot of those big towers came along, you know, as early as the late 80s, early 90s. They're pretty recent type thing. Mm. Yeah, funny enough, that takes me back to one of my favourite courses at university. It was the historical geographies of London. Precisely, fantastic. and London's yeah. a great example. Like, yeah. it started off as a swamp. Yes, exactly. like you either had yeah. two two ideas of a city. It was on the top of the hill, or it was in a swamp because you could mm. defend it. And <laughs> both London and Paris were swamps. Yeah, oh. and then you built. You know, it's a bit like the Monty Python where the first the first castle sinks. Then you build another one, and <laughs> and, and, it, and then it, you know got a wall <laughs> around it. Um, mm. But yeah, the, and the 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 Industrial Revolution, which, yeah. you know, took off because of a whole range of different reasons, you know, proximity to the right materials and yeah. all that. And, and yeah, the way it changed the structure of the city with the train infrastructure, the telephone. Absolutely. Yeah. The technology. And obviously what galvanised the change in the first place was normally public outcry for something that had happened, you know, the big stink or whatever it might have been. Yeah, one of my favourite yeah. books is a book called Pandemonium written by a, uh, an academic Mm. in the 1920s and it's um, it, it's clippings of newspaper articles at the time of significant events oh, that's cool. yeah. um, and the first running of a train which actually killed a politician and yeah, to, yeah. to actually read about the the uproar of the time and the, the reluctance to embrace this new technology. I, I think there's a propensity of humans to mm. not fully understand the potential, uh, it, you know, good and bad. Yeah. Uh, of what's possible. We can see it with our embracing of technology maybe too early. In Definitely. Because yeah. they had those speed restrictions on all trains in Europe because they thought it would explode, our bodies would mm. explode if you went over that speed. Yeah. And the first cars, you know, you had to wave a red flag or walk with a red flag before them. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. the horses out of the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can you imagine, yeah. like, can you imagine the smell of a city like New York in mm. 1905 before the car? I mean, it must have been yeah, pretty, a pretty grim. Yeah. Well, then pretty even when the car came in, I imagine they weren't so, I mean, you know. Yeah, they were a bit smelly and yeah. steamy <laughs> and <laughs> dangerous. Well, no now with electric cars, they'd probably, would probably say the same thing in 10, 15 years. Can you imagine having all these fuel cars being yeah. stuck in traffic? Mm. Yeah. Assuming. That ends up being widely adopted. It's just sort of everything else, right? The lack of a standardised garbage collection or like working sewer system and everything else. It's yeah, it's pretty grim. It's been amazing the yeah. last few hundred years. But the, yeah. the, I, I think also something that's not on this topic, but mm. probably I think it might be interesting for you to explore is around the logistics industry and the whole last mile of delivery. You know, every we all use online shopping to an enormous degree, and the way we we move all those goods around cities, um, I think. Uh, going to be a massive change. Mm. I was at the Tokyo Motor Show a couple of years ago and there was hardly any new motor vehicles. It was all, you know, even suitcase size autonomous vehicles that would yeah. whip around apartment buildings dropping off. That's, that's going to be really, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. Well, one of our members is sort of in the um, the last, yeah, the last mile delivery space. Yeah, and, uh, well, I, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd I'm yeah. interested in that. I don't know if anyone else mm. is. Yeah, yeah Joe, <laughs> yeah. Joe, who we had on the podcast, yeah, Joe Shoffra, special Shofra. shout out. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was fascinating talking about where, where they see the future going, um, and obviously testing, you know, delivery men with sort of big autonomous suits and everything else like that. 
uh, or me mechanized suits rather. Obviously, that's a little bit more clunky, but yeah, than the whole drone delivery aspect and um, how they're sort of creating revenue through through advertising for the the company they're delivering for, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the way and the AI that they're using to, to catch eye movement and stuff. Like, very yeah, and and yeah, all the sustain. You know, it's it's about ten to fifteen percent of the economy, so it's a mm. it's a massive part of how everything works. Yeah. But I think also in uh, some of the things I was saying about. Um, you know, the property industry and technology, I'm, uh, a lot of organisations are, you know, in the business of providing systems for buildings and people have tried to create a bit like the Microsoft world where it's a closed system and they can control mm. it. But the, the next generation is going to be middleware that will be able to get basically just bits of data to talk to other bits of data for that moment you need to make the transaction. Yeah. And I think that's a really growing, interesting area yeah. where you can white label it so that you can brand the, the output to be a, an ecosystem. Like we're working on a, uh, a health innovation building, which is between a university and a hospital. Okay. And there'll be a lot of research going on there. And some of it will be, you know, funded. Some of them, some of it will be supported. You know, the only way to really run that is through really good software interfaces that enable you to book space, mm. you know, measure in real time the use of space, yeah. you know, alert you if events are going on. Yeah. So, you know, that whole middleware then branded and and this idea of what's called physical rights management which is to instead of that 10-year lease and london used to have 25-year leases until reasonably recently you know now to actually hour by hour choose you know who's allowed could be a community group after hours for example yep. you will give them the physical rights with the security access and everything and the ability to choose you know the technology and the food or whatever they want for those meetings. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a real growing area of, of interest to, to, and you can see how that would work. You know, it's already happening in retail, where it'll, you know, with all the um, beacon technology, it'll, it's been around for a decade now. It'll nudge you when, you know, you bought a pair of these jeans to, you know, the, the, the shirts now half price or you know whatever, all of that. It, with knowledge and business, I think that's going to be really exciting. If you know people opt in and the data's secure. Yeah, exactly. All right, Alex, let's get into some uh, shorter form. I can do that. So, James, questions with these, you know, please expand on your answer. It'd be interesting to know why you chose your the answer you've selected. Can you think of any book that's had a big impact on your life, or one that you'd like to recommend? I'd, you reference I, a number of articles. I can tell you so. one not to read, which was On the Road by Jack Kerouac when you're starting out at work for the first time because it just makes you want to quit and uh, yeah. go and do something different with your life. Mm. That messed me up for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the answer you want. No. Uh, I've, um, uh, that Pandemonium book I mentioned was, was mm. very influential. I think um, a lot more... more in, in my lifetime anyway, more, more articles. I, I've got a, I mean, there's all the, the classic books on business and I think just be a, mm. be a sort of magpie and read everything you can. I mean, I, I think things, you know, it's very basic, but um, things like the, you know, how to use time efficiently and, yeah. you know, don't sweat the small stuff and those things, I think they're 101s for anyone starting out. Mm. Um, there's one I, I used. I helped set up a master's course at Melbourne Uni in the yeah. architecture school, and um, it was on the future office and things like that. And I had to pull together a, a reading list. Yeah. Um, one of the books I put on there, which my wife actually read on a holiday, was Dale Carnegie: How to Win Friends and Influence ah, People. Yeah. And she said, "I'm read. I'm there. What are you reading?" And I said, "That's that's like ancient. That's rubbish, isn't it?" She said, "No, no, it's really good." So, I finished my books and read it. It was fantastic, it was really good. So I put it, you know, I'm trying to get architects to think a bit more like business people, because okay. um, that's the clients, and that's mm. what we're trying to do. Is that I where put they talk it, about smiling? And uh, yeah, smiling and, and, and remembering people's names and, and, oh, and the yes. basics of, it's all the basics of, yes. you know, getting on with people in, in your life and work. Yeah. And I remember anyway, um, putting it on the reading list and, and the professor told me to take it off because it was rubbish, but I insisted. Yeah. Then I was, um, I did a lot of work with, well, I still do with lawyers and professional service firms. And there was this Harvard expert called David Meister. 
Mm. And he was like the professional services firm consultant. And uh, they all used him. They used to fly him out to Australia. And I remember going to one of his talks and he stood up and said, you only need one book in management consulting and that's how to win friends and influence people. So I felt vindicated a bit. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, James. But, but I think a lot of articles, you know, mm. the knowledge is now so spread out um, yeah. that, that I, you know, I think scour the HBRs and all of that is, is, is a basic thing. The um, Sorry, scale, you said. Is uh, the yeah, just scour, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. yeah. And mm. I think um, at the moment, you know, my favourite is the spatial web book. Um, I think that's really, it's got the most, the first chapter is the most succinct understanding of what's gone on in the last 30 years of technology that I've read. Oh, great. Mm. Thank you. I should get a cut if I'm promoting it. Yeah, so we'll put them on the show notes. <laughs> yeah, uh, affiliate yeah, exactly. from Amazon or, or Booktopia. <laughs> Thanks. And related to that, do you have a favourite quote? I've got a few. I actually collect a bunch of them on, on my phone. One of them would be a firm grasp of the obvious. You know, we can overcomplicate things. And when, you know, I, I'm lucky in my work, I get to meet all sorts of business leaders across all sectors. You know, I've mm. done, I've met, you know, a lot of the people you've read about in the, you know, mm. CEOs and things over the last 20 years. And that's what they have. They have a really firm grasp of the straightforward and obvious. And I think you build on that rather than creating complexity. Do you have a passion that we, we might not know about you? or a new interest that you discovered? Despite, you know, embracing the digital age in work, I, I quite like collecting books. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a, I've actually got a motoring book collection that I'm oh, cool. continuously uh, scouring mm. auctions for. And that's what I, yeah, that's. Are these sort of own, owner's manuals or are they? A few of those, or, but yeah. no, it's just all sorts. There, there are beautiful writs, uh, books written on, I, I, for one reason or another, I think I just was born that way. I. I I like automotive design, yeah. And uh, and as Ralph Lauren said, like, why buy art when you can buy some art that moves? And <laughs> he has an amazing collection of automobiles, probably the best in the world. But yeah. you know, they're, they're amazing books that you know are, are written mm -hmm. um, and produced. And you know, I like the whole. Yeah, you know, I'm into the design of the yeah. books and the cars. And well, sort of weirdly linked to that. Um, the other day we were looking for a sort of a motoring atlas of France, thinking of going on holiday there and uh, online shopping for one. I hadn't realized they're collector's pieces. So, you know, the ones from 99, 2000s are thousands of dollars. Yeah, for really? A little, for a metering atlas. Couldn't huh. believe it. Yeah, do yeah. they still make atlases? Don't yeah, the just... Michelin guides of the... Yeah, yeah that, no, it, exactly. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about that earlier. They, mm. Yeah, and, the, and the, the purpose of them was to try and, when the, the automobile first came around, was to get people to start driving to the countryside and explore things. Yeah, and, and the, yeah. the whole restaurant rating sort of moved on mm. the back of that, didn't it? Excellent. Thanks, James. Um, James, if you were to give your younger self some advice, what would it be? Um, I wouldn't sort of change too much. I think the I was really lucky. I actually had a cafe <laughs> at university, and and yeah. it was interested in. Yeah, you know, certainly gave me a a good sort of understanding of costs and <laughs> running a business and <laughs> things, which was very useful, but. Um, I was lucky that I fell into a field that was endlessly interesting and I guess that's what I would yeah. you know, tell myself is don't just have a linear career where you, you're kind of confined in something that's maybe not that evolving to, to get some, yeah, you know, what I do is, you know, it's, it's space, it's design, it's humans, it's management, mm. culture and theory, mm. technology, you know, cities, it's, it's endlessly fascinating. So that, that's what I would say to find, yeah. find areas that are quite open-ended and become a specialist in some of it so that you can dive into it. Yeah, well, that's good, thanks. And um, if you're thinking about your legacy, what would you like that to be? Well, the, the, the good thing about being a designer type is you actually get to build stuff. So <laughs> um, I, it was a... It was an interesting. I was waiting in line for a uh, at the local primary school during an election, and someone had just joined this organisation where I'd just done their building, and they were just talking about their experience of coming to this building and how, you know, it was quite a radical space, very different than any other building in the okay. in the city, and they were talking about how they loved it, and I thought that was. I, I've always thought that 
you know, there's a big responsibility in doing this. People are, are going to spend a lot of time in these buildings and countless hours of human endeavour mm. to make it as good a human space as possible is kind of a big responsibility. Same with the hospital that I'm working on. I kind of wish I'd got into health uh, quicker because the the workplace is really outdated, not very good, there's no daylight and all of that, and yet these are some of the most valuable people we have in society. So Definitely. Yeah, I think that's what what you know us designers are, are sort of tasked with is to doing our best to create a good human environment yeah. for you know many many generations to come because these buildings should last a long time. Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. Hopefully, if your legacy is intact, there will still be there for a long oh, time, I, I, and the design. No, I think all what is it? Good. <laughs> we we plan and God laughs. You know, <laughs> who knows. <laughs> Oh. All right, now we've got some rapid fire. Do you want me to do my uh, timer? If you have a minute. Oh, I thought they were the rapid fire. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they were harder than that the was, other uh, questions. Pretty, pretty yeah. relaxed q and I think Alex went easy on you. <laughs> All right. James, these are just um, the first thing that comes to mind, either or questions. Are we ready, Dave? I wrote some with my handwriting, so just seeing, luck, I'll, Alex. I'll try and decipher those. <laughs> okay, you will start with those. All right, here we go. Corner office or hot desk? Neither. Can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> North facing or west facing? Depends on the day. <laughs> office plants, real or fake? Real. Mm. <laughs> CBD or metro? CBD. Mm. Lease or buy? Neither, use, use as you go. Hmm. Fashion or form? Form. Nine to five or flexi hours? Flex. Mm. Private or communal? Communal. Cash or loan? Cash. Three year or seven year term? Three. Mm. Public speaking or written communication? Both. Mm. Organic growth or strategic partnerships? Uh, they should be the same thing, I think, yes. Mm. <laughs> Long term planning or agile adaption? Yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, In-house development or outsourcing? In-house, I think. Data-driven decisions or intuition-led choices? Yeah, get, get an expert in both and put them together. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a minute. I actually let it go an extra 15. I think I only got one <laughs> out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's interesting because yeah. you kind of, a lot of them you were like, neither, neither, neither. And I think, you know, true to design, there's obviously so many choices and options and different yeah. ranges even within, down to the micro decisions. So it's, I mean, it must be like, you mentioned finding a career that you love. Mm. I mean, you couldn't think about how many decisions go into a design starting with, well, as you were saying, those three things start with location and moving from there to creating a great space space and experience so it's, i found that interesting the way you were answering that <laughs> so yeah it is hard because you you know each word you're thinking of all the theory sure. and whatever behind each one and you you know neither of them by themselves actually work <laughs> terribly well yeah <laughs> but that's why you did it exactly <laughs> <laughs> thank you well, james yeah Was thank you thank you james thank you for pleasure. your time today yeah. thanks for your energy and we didn't quite get to talking about the citroen but we can oh, continue fine. that conversation um, and yeah. yeah, looking forward to walking through one of your buildings soon. And for the for the listeners out there, if you do walk through a great space, the designer may be in the foyer. So maybe tell someone, and they'll that'll, overhear it and that'll make be their interesting. Day. Put some three dimensionality to it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thanks, Thanks for James. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure. Cheers. Yeah. Hey, this is Alex. If you enjoyed the content so far, and you want us to do more, if you want to hear more, click the subscribe button. It allows us to bring on more guests in the future. Thanks.